Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm the president and CEO of Fire Safe Sonoma. I'm Roberta McIntyre, for those that don't know. And with me today is Ellie Inslee. She is with the Sonoma Ecology Center and she's a landscape architect. She knows a lot about plants. I know almost nothing about plants. I have a black thumb. I have plastic plants in my house because I kill the real plants. Um, and then also with us is Hunter McLaughlin. He's with the Sonoma County Transportation and Public Works. And he is the project manager for the funding that is allowing us to do this webinar today and the future webinars. He also will talk about the fuels reduction efforts that, that is part of this project that's going on out in West County. And also with us is Kaylin Knott. She's a Fire Safe Sonoma's um, Civic Spark Fellow helping us out and she's uh, sharing her work effort with Fire Safe Sonoma and the Goldridge RCD. This webinar is on the zero to five foot home ignition zone. It's part of a three part series. The next one we're gonna do is really related to the fields reduction on the ground and in the, in the vegetation from the five foot zone out to 30 feet or more, depending on your circumstances. Um, and then part three is specific to structural hardening. So just about the format, we'll probably go do the presentation. We'll probably take about an hour, thereabouts, and then we're gonna take questions. What I'm probably gonna do, because Hunter has to go pretty quickly, what I'll do is I'll have him talk about the project and we'll, I'll set aside a few minutes so that if you have any questions about the project, we can blast through those, but I might have to, depending on the number of questions we get there, if it seems like a lot to handle, then I'll just leave those in the queue and we'll try, I'll forward those to Hunter and maybe he can get them uh, responded to later. Do you guys want to just real quickly introduce yourselves um, in, for the group? Um, starting with Ellie. Well, um, I'm with the Sonoma Ecology Center. I'm a board member. Uh, I'm a landscape architect and um, I started a group called the Resilient Landscapes Coalition that's mostly about defensible, it is about defensible space um, in the wildland urban interface and we concentrate on uh, sustainable biodiverse landscapes uh, that are also fire wise. And yeah, that's it. Okay, Hunter, do you want to tell us about you real quick in a nutshell? Sure, so I'm with uh, Sonoma County Public Works and I am in the land development and traffic section um, as a junior engineer. And I also do our grants uh, for the department. Okay, and Kaylin, a real quick introduction. You know, you're new with Fire Safe Sonoma, but you're a godsend. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, sorry, there's like there's some noise behind me, so hopefully it's not too annoying. But um, as you mentioned, Roberta, I'm a Civic Spark America or fellow, splitting my time between the Goldridge Resource Conservation District and Fire Safe Sonoma. I am working primarily uh, with wildfire prevention outreach and emergency preparedness. Um, this is a new field for me, and my background's in city planning, so I'm learning a lot. Um, looking forward to co learn with all of you. Okay, thank you guys. So now, all of our attendees, you all know the group. So here we go. Uh, so Hunter, I'm gonna hand it off to you and you could talk about the project. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, the, the lifespan of it, where you guys are in the project, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all yours, Hunter. Sure, thank you, Roberta. Um, so yes, CAL FIRE um, in 2018 uh, awarded us the Northwest Roadway Safety Fuels Reduction and Community Chipper and Engagement Project. Um, and these funds come from the California Climate Investment um, Program is how Cal, Cal Fire funds this. Um, so over the last couple of years, we've been progressing on the project um, and Fire Safe Sonoma um, and Permit Sonoma Fire Prevention and State Parks are all partners on the project. And so the different parts, um, the project area 
is um, the areas between the communities of Casadero, Guerneville, Monterio, Rio Nido, Timber Cove, and Fort Ross, and then was expanded a few months ago to include Occidental and Camp Meeker. Um, so we have those areas as well. Um, the project has three different components. Um, the first one is there's a free curbside chipper program uh, for residents within those areas uh, of the project. And that is led by uh, Permit Sonoma Fire Prevention. Uh, and so they're partnering with us on the project. Then as um, Roberta has mentioned, um, the outreach and education, uh, Fire Safe Sonoma is partnering with us on that aspect of it. And so they're doing home assessments uh, and outreach at events and then workshops such as this one that we're here today for. And then the last component for the project, um, which I am the most involved in, is the roadside fuels reduction. And so here is a map of the project area. Um, the roads that have the yellow behind them are county maintained roads. And there's 83 miles um, within the original project area. And we went along those um, myself and somebody from fire prevention uh, drove those roads and we selected 30 miles to be surveyed uh, for dead, dying, and hazardous trees. And then it was um, further reduced down um, into a project that was advertised and went out to bid um, this past August. Um, and there are roads that were selected within this area for treatment and removal of those trees that will be happening hopefully in the next month and a half um, to two months, that work will begin and will go on for a couple months. And so that's along the different road segments. Um, so that's a, the project in a nutshell. Um, uh, yeah, and then I'm gonna chime in real quick and let folks know that um, one of Fire Safe Sonoma's roles in this project is to provide uh, wildland uh, home assessments where we'll send a certified credentialed uh, wildland mitigation specialist out to your house if you would like us to and he'll walk through your house and give you an assessment in terms of what your risks are what you might want to improve upon what you should trim etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you're interested in that feel free to, to reach out to us via email or phone uh, you can get to us through our website and if you're in that project area, you th there's a very good chance that you either have received or will be receiving a postcard letting you know about the project. Um, so, and then, Andre, do you want to talk about the expanded area, or do you want me to? Um, sure, I can mention. So, the blue and the green areas are where the project has expanded. So all of these areas are eligible for the home assessments, like Roberta mentioned, and for the free chipping. And so I believe the free chipping, you can sign up for that through SoCo Alert. Um, there's an online, um, or SoCo Report it. Is I was what gonna it is. say, yeah, thank you. Yeah, SoCo, SoCo Report. Alert on our mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so you can go onto the county's website and find um, out how to fill that out. Um, to get that um, yeah. in the queue, um, so those two. So I'd encourage um, you guys to take advantage of both of those, um, the home assessments and the chipping uh, through Perfect. this project. Okay, thanks Hunter. Um, and then I'm gonna back up here a second. So mm -hmm. let me stop share and just ask, does anybody have any questions specific to anything that Hunter talked about before he has to go, because he's gonna have to bail. Um, <laughs> where are I the road segments that have been selected for tree removal? Let me go back up a page and maybe you can help walk that okay. through. Hunter. So what are the road segments that are specifically set aside for tree removal? There's not much tree removal, is there? Is there, or is there a lot? Um, there's over 400 trees. Um, okay. So, so let's see. So Fort Ross Road from Myers Bay to Casadero. Okay, so from here to here, all along here? Okay. Yeah, 
So, and not the whole, we went along the different road segments and found the worst um, that needed to be treated. Some of the areas along the roads didn't need treatment. So those areas won't be treated, but for the most part, the whole roads will be treated. Okay, so Fort Ross Road, King Ridge Road. Right here. From Casadero yeah. to Tin Barn Road. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't. Oh, it's yeah, all the, it's the whole, yeah, it's all the whole road segment, there's, yeah. There's Tim Barn here, yeah. Yeah, Hauser Bridge Road, so that goes from King Ridge Road or Tin Barn Road down to Seaview Road. Yeah, right here. Right there, yeah. And then Old Casadero Road uh, from where it narrows to a one lane road all the way to where the, um, where there was a slide back in 2017. Um, so it's about four miles of that road. And then, let's see, there's one more, Rio Nito Road. Yeah, we probably don't have the detail here. To it's check. right there, yeah, yeah. It goes from like Armstrong Road. Um, okay, here. Yeah, that segment right there. Okay. Um, so those, I believe there's five different road segments that were selected for treatment. Um, okay. And I just want to share with folks um, the, the, you know, the focus for this work is to improve the evacuation ability of, of folks in these areas. So having this one across here on Fort Ross Road is good to, to get folks up in Casadero and the river. It, it gives them opportunity to come across this way and then get down to Highway 1 if need be, et cetera. So the, the circulators are meant to make these evacuation roadways more robust and safer for evacuation. That, that's a big focus for the project. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to, thank you, Hunter. Um, if you yeah. have to run, uh, I will pick it up from here. Um, you know, also folks know that Rio Nido and Monterio, there's little sections uh, in those areas as well. Um, you know, where, where this is being offered. Okay, thank you, Hunter. Thank you, have a good one. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, wildfires obviously are bigger and burn longer than they have before. In fact, with the recent fires we've had, I haven't had a chance to update this presentation to include the more recent data and information. So when we get to that slide, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but they, clearly they're getting bigger and badder. This is the Kincaid fire from my house um, up towards, you know, Middletown area. And, you know, the fires we're seeing now are easily within, uh, you know, 10 miles of our, our developed areas. Coffee Park, I mean, right in Coffee Park. And mostly that has to do with embers. And that's a lot about what we're gonna talk about here. So here's my data that goes as far as Kincaid. I do apologize. I don't have the most recent data. I meant to put it in there, just didn't get a chance. But in terms of the history, if you look at what's going on, back here in 64 is the Hanley fire and the Nuns Canyon fire, they kind of burned, you know, the same time frame. Um, also, not long after the next year, 65, you also had Arrowhead Mountain. And then Northwest Santa Rosa, there was a small fire uh, in 1965 as well. So if you take back then the Hanley Nuns fire, marry that to the Arrowhead Mountain fire, you've essentially got that here during the what I think generically is being called the wine country fires, the nuns fire, the pubs fire, the pocket fire. Um, that's all rolled into here. Now, if you were to stack all these acreages on top of each other, uh, I'd be willing to bet that these, this acreage is more. In fact, you could probably do the math. I haven't. And then the Kincaid fire in 19 is right here. So what I really want to show you here is that you know, if this is the timeline of the fire that we have since 1944, as far back as this goes, 
you can see that got some fire here, burned a little bit, years go by. But what I'm seeing, and I think we all can see it, is increased frequency of fire and increased acreage of fire, and certainly increased loss in terms of the economy and money, et cetera. But um, if we all work together and reduce the risk, then we can help save some of that total loss, uh, particularly in property loss. And, you know, fortunately, we haven't lost a lot of lives, but um, there's that too. We want to save lives, we want to protect property, and at the same time, as best we can, we want to preserve the environment. Um, but if we all work together, uh, we can certainly, you know, with, through um, defensible space best practices and philosophies and structural hardening concepts, we can save our property, very likely, certainly reduce the risk, and uh, potentially save lives because, um, you know, I think less people will be fearful about leaving to get out of the way if they can be more assured that their home is going to be there when they come back. So that's kind of a, a give and take byproduct there. Um, but that's the idea. So the, the vulnerability of your home is driven by you know, your home's local ignitability. So you have to ask yourself, you know, how, how combustible is my house? You know, what are the, what's the state of the materials, the phys physical state of the materials that my house is built of? Do I have a lot of small little pieces of combustible material like lath? Um, little architectural details where an ember can land on it and take hold. Do I have a lot of little nooks and crannies? Uh, maybe with sidewall shingles or board and batten type of construction where an ember can get in a crack and, and get going. Um, so the vulnerability of you losing your home has a lot to do with what's going on with the building. But also in recent fires, we've certainly discovered that um, the zero to five foot space from the from the envelope of your structure, not the envelope, but your exterior walls of your structure to about five or 10 feet out, that's a really vulnerable area. Now keep in mind, we're not talking about structural hardening with this presentation. We're talking about that zero to five uh, home ignition area as it's called, or the non-combustible area as it's being called these days. So um, there are things we can do within that footprint to, to reduce the risk. Um, and here's a little you know, nugget. Post-fire studies have shown that most buildings ignited during a wildfire have been completely destroyed. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if we can keep our home from being ignited, we're gonna reduce the, the risk that our, or in the likelihood that our house will be completely destroyed. And that involves maintaining a mostly you know, hardscape, some plants, we'll talk about that, but maintaining a real good non-ignition zone in the distance between the outside of your house walls and five to 10 feet out. Um, so here's, hey, Roberto. yeah. A question came in on the chat that I feel might be best answered now. Okay. Someone asked, those homes left standing were protected by fire, did the fires burn through and um, say that again. I'm, I, I didn't catch all of that. Someone asked if the homes were left standing because they are protected by firefighters, or was it simply that the fires burned through and didn't burn the house? Um, both of those have happened, but it's my belief from what I've read and studied that the houses that were lost are usually lost because you know they were consumed entirely. Um, and homes that were saved were, or left standing I should say, are left standing for one of two reasons. Most of the time I think the fundamental primary reason is that an ember did not get into an area close enough to the house to ignite any combustibles and or an ember did not get in through a vent or someplace into the structure to burn it from the inside out. And with structural hardening, we talk about how, a little bit about how the embers get into a house and how a house can burn from the inside out. And when you look at, 
you know, the bird's eye view of that after the fact, you're left scratching your head like, why, why is all the vegetation around this building gone? But I mean, it's still there, but the house is completely gone. And oftentimes that's because an ember got into the house or right up next to the house and consumed the house. I, I know of some cases where firefighters did get to a structure in time and, and put it out. Uh, where I live in Hidden Valley Lake up in Lake County, there are, you know, after the Valley Fire, I drove around up here and I saw at least two or three circumstances where it looked to me like a ember landed in vegetation. And one time, you know, I, I noticed it was Jennifer's uh, and then caught a fence on fire or something like that and then started to catch a house on fire, but then it stopped. In those instances, I believe that those were cases where the, the fire suppression resources got there in time and put it out before the building completely was consumed. So with that said, the three things that are really, that you really need to protect the structure from are radiant heat, wind blown embers, and direct flame contact. And I call that the red, you know, Reds for radiant heat, E's for embers, and D's for direct flame contact. So if you want a way to rem remember that as you're doing work around your house, protecting yourself from a wild vampire, just keep in mind you're protecting yourself from the red, the radiant heat, the embers, and the direct flame contact. But of those three, the most insidious is the embers. Those, those nasty guys can, can get into your furnishings on your five foot area or into your crawl space or into your attic and totally get a good fire going to consume your whole house. Um, one way you can check to see how at risk your house is is to have a home assessment done. Fire Safe Sonoma, as I mentioned earlier, we have resources to put in the West County area, if you're in that, particularly if you're in the project area described, give us a call, shoot us an email, and we'll send uh, Stuart, this guy here out, um, or one of our contractors, to go out and do a home assessment. And they'll walk around the house with you and give you suggestions on what you should trim and what you might want to do structural hardening wise and those kinds of things. Um, and then you could prioritize those based on how much risk you're going to reduce and how much you have to spend on each particular item. Let's see. So once again, what we're telling you here is that most of the destructive structure fires really are as a result of the embers. And embers, they're, they're, they're insidious. I, I'm working on this public service announcement where many of you attendees probably remember this public service announcement where the, they're there with a frying pan and he's like, oh, this is your brain and then cracks an egg on the hot frying pan and it cooks. And he's like, this is your brain on drugs. Well, I'm working on a, a public service announcement that's, that's emulating that. And it's, I'm gonna have a vent with quarter inch vents, a house vent like you'd see in your underfloor or soffit area typically. And I'm gonna have a box of rice. In fact, they're right here. I call them, you know, these are called embers. And so I'm gonna take that vent and pour the rice through and go, this is, this is the vents around your house. These are the embers that are flying around in a firestorm. And pour the, the rice through the vent and you'll clearly see that the rice goes right through that vent. And it's like, any questions? So, but we'll talk more about that in the structural hardening. Incorporating an occupiable zone gives you protection because it reduces the opportunity of a fire starting in that area next to or close to your house and getting into the house. Most homes in our part of the world are made of combustible materials. Um, you know, I, I tell people sometimes building a house out of wood in a forest, it's kind of like building a boat out of a wa water and putting it in the ocean. But we do it, it's, it's our circumstances. So the question is, what can we do to help keep fire off our house? So um, if you do nothing, uh, if you don't have a lot of money to do structural hardening, 
if you don't have a lot of resources to go out and give yourself a 300 foot or more defensible space, taking out trees and cutting all that stuff up, certainly you can spend a little time in this five foot area around your house, getting rid of all the combustibles in that area. And if you have plants, make sure they're the right plants and they're in, the plants are installed correctly. Um, and then if you do have anything, make it so combustible, make it easy to move out the way later. So once again, we're talking about this home ignition zone. The home ignition zone includes, if you have a wooden deck, it includes the area five feet out from your deck, okay? Um, and you know, when, when we talk about defensible space, we really divide it up into the separate zones. Usually there's three zones, the home ignition zone, five to 10 feet out from the house, your defensible space zone proper, which is from your five to 10 foot out to at least 30 feet, code says 100 feet if you're in a wooey area, and beyond if you're on a slope. Um, so, you know, so we come up with this terminology so we can talk about it and understand what we all are talking about. Um, but today we're talking about specifically that five to 10 foot out away from your house. Uh, and once again, that's called the home ignition zone. We're, there is a move to get legislation in place that will um, legislate the zero to five foot area as a non-combustible zone and make it a requirement that you do certain things in that area. And I think where we are now with that is, we're trying to quantify and um, come up with as objective a way as we can to measure what is correct and what is not correct in that area. And I think once that's figured out, then the legislation will probably pass and go through. Um, from what I understand, that's kind of where we are, we're at with that now. But what the code says currently is, um, you know, you basically you have out to 100 feet if you're in a wild and urban interface or a wooded area, uh, you have to you know, maintain defensible space, fuels reduction, et cetera, out to you know, 100 feet. There's no code requirement that I'm aware of that requires you to maintain that zero to five foot, but it is a good practice in maintaining it will, you, will reduce your risk and the fact that embers are what's gonna get you just totally reinforces that concept and the rationale for doing that. So the idea is to, as best you can, you know, once again, we're not talking about the structure so much today. That's a, another webinar presentation later. But we're talking about making sure that the plants you put in this five to 10 foot out area are not plants that are gonna dry out, not plants that are grouped together in big bunches, uh, you know, they, they, if an ember lands in it, it's going to catch on fire and burn your, catch your house on fire. And as much as possible, use non-combustible mulch or hardscaping in that area. Um, so the way, as Walt Disney said, the way to get started is to quit talking and start doing. And of all three of the defensible space concepts, the, the you know, defensible space out to 100 feet, and the structural hardening piece and the zero to five you know, home ignition zone piece of the three of those concepts, I honestly believe that this is the one, the zero to five foot is the, the, probably the most important and economically the easiest to tackle right away uh, without spending a lot of money. You just have to get out and do it. Um, and you know, I, I use this, la this image on another slide when I talk about ladder fields works perfect for that. Um, that's for our next, next webinar. So the zero to five, you know, if you've got stuff like this, get it away from your house. If it's wood like this, I would say even put it farther out like 30 feet. You know, anything, even your garbage cans, it, you know, if they're shut, probably not as big of a deal, but if you've got your, your, your garbage cans and they're overflowing and the lid's not on it, if an ember can land there, it's probably gonna create a, a trash can fire big enough to catch your house on fire. I, I have this little litmus test that I 
ask people to do hypothetically. I'm not saying to actually do this, but here's a hypothetical litmus test for you. If you can take a red hot glowing ember out of your briquette barbecue, grab it with a pair of tongs, go out, particularly in the five foot area or anywhere out in your yard, close your eyes and throw that thing up in the air. If you can do that and not have a care in the world about where that red hot briquette lands, then you're probably gonna be okay. If you can't do that, then that's, that's your target. You know, that's the goal to be able to do that, at least hypothetically. Imagine doing that and ask yourself, could I do that? Um, if you can't, then, you know, let's try to get from here to there. Um, if you have stuff like this, things going into the eaves, we're not talking about just the ground, just the horizontal area out from your foundation, but everywhere around, you know, from ground to, to the altitude, all around that exterior wall of your house, if you've got stuff, you know, that's, that could bring fire onto your house, that's bad. This is my house. Um, before, actually I have it on, in all honestly, I still need to trim these. It's on my list of to-dos this Saturday. But, um, you know, if we got an ember landing in here somewhere, there is some dead branches in this oak tree. It could easily get an ember here or in this rain gutter and catch this on fire. I've got sidewall shingles here. You know, a lot of surface area, thin, thin combustible wood material there where a fire can take hold there pretty quickly. So this, on my house is not good. If this is something you have, trim this stuff back, get it away from the house. All around your house, I suggest cut anything around your house away five to six feet if you can, but the code does not require that unless it's dead. I think it's good practice to do it anyway. Um, the other thing to be aware of there, if you've got power lines going to your house, if there was a, you know, a service line going through here, you want to clear all the branches away from the service line. When you're lopping off those branches, so be very careful. You don't want to accidentally lop through that power line. Um, and so you want to get that stuff away. The other thing that is code required is overhanging branches live or dead need to be cleared away from any chimney outlets. So be aware of that. That's a code requirement. But the rest of the house, you know, I would recommend you do it anyway, even if it's not dead. Code requires dead wood, get it off away from the house. Definitely clean the gutters. You know, we talk about gutters at length in our structural hardening presentation. But the thing about this is all tinder. You know, this is tinder for starting a fire. If I was gonna make a campfire, first thing I'd be looking for is dry leaves and then little pieces of wood, and then you put the big wood on. But if you an ember drops in here, get a little fire going. These, this is a class A roof. These shingles are rated class A, but a class A roof is a whole assembly. If you go a little fire here, I can guarantee you the edge of these composition shingles will catch on fire and sustain ignition and start your roof on fire. The other thing, depending on how your roof edge is set up, if you've got a little edge of plywood showing there, amber lands in here in, the, in this tinder in the rain gutter, it this when I look at stuff like this, I see, oh, campfire. So you get a little fire going here. If, if you do have that exposed wood edge there, it's, it's going to be short order before it gets into that plywood and onto your roof and start to consume your entire house. Another good idea in the five foot areas, if you have a wooden fence attached to the building, is to do one of two things. If you can afford to to put a section of non-combustible fence there. Most of us, I think, probably put our gates right next to the house because we have a real nice hardscaped uh, walkway there. And so if you've got a hardscaped walkway there, you know, the concrete or pavers, whatever it is, or even, you know, non-combustible mulch like gravel, then why not put a metal gate there too? and just make that zero to five foot non-combustible area even more non-combustible. So another thing you could do is if you do have a wooden fence with a wooden gate and you're ready to evacuate, pull that gate open and block it open with something really heavy because oftentimes we have some really 
really crazy winds during these fires. And if you just open the gate and expect it to stay open, it'll probably shut and then the latch will hold it shut. So if you do have a wooden gate, I recommend before you evacuate, open it and put a big rock there or something non-combustible heavy, grab a couple pavers, put there whatever you've got that you can use to hold that gate open so that not if, but when your fence catches on fire, it'll, it won't be a fuse going all the way to your house to ignite it. Uh, you know, I see, I see this fence, I see a fuse. Um, you know, this little lattice here is, is a little small for my taste and Ember can land here and get this guy going, but she's got this set up really well. So even if her fence caught on fire, the likelihood of it getting into the house is, is much reduced. Also be aware that it's, you can have combustible materials in that zero five foot area, but if you do make them portable and modular so that when you get your order to evacuate, you can grab all, all those things, all the lawn furniture, the mats laying on the ground, you know, stuff that's out on our decks or on our patios or in that five foot area. If it's combustible, have it be portable enough so you can grab it and take it into the house uh, um, and then put it in there before you evacuate. Uh, this is my house, this is my firefighter's flag. This comes in if I have to evacuate because I don't want an ember, you know, catching the flag on fire and catching the house on fire. Um, so you want to move all that stuff in or don't have it, you know, have wrought iron furniture, glass furniture, non-combustible furniture, then you don't have to worry about it. Me, I like to sit on cushions, so um, at least the cushions are coming in. Uh, around the exterior of your, of your foundation, we don't want combustible mulch here. It should be either dirt uh, this is mostly dirt. There is a light layer of leaves there. It doesn't bother me. I don't feel like this light layer of leaves is enough that's going to sustain enough of an ignition to get my house going because I've got a good six inches or more distance between the ground and the edge of my wood siding. Um, as you can see, I still need to work on my vents. But um, if you've got combustible mulch here, it can get going catch your siding on fire. If you've got a plant here it, that you know, gets an ember in it, if it's a kind of plant that's gonna su sustain ignition, then it could get your siding going. So, you know, and the other thing here too is you shouldn't have dirt up against here or near here for insects and rot as well. It's just, it's just good home maintenance not to have any dirt against any wood around your house, have that distance. Um, if it's if you get too close here, bugs and insects, and I think maybe even termites can get in your house if you've got that. But for us, get it away from there. The other thing too that makes this so important is even if, even if you've got non-combustible mulch here, during the wind conditions that we get with some of the fires we're seeing, it's gonna blow those leaves and, and pine needles and stuff in against there. So even though you rake it up and you've got non-combustible mulch and nothing's there, halfway through a fire front with all the stuff blowing in, it can blow combustible material in there in front of embers and get it going. So the better you maintain it, the, the more you reduce the risk of that happening. Okay, so this is reinforcing what we're talking about, the strong likelihood of ember attack in most wildland fire events means that homes are most vulnerable to ignition in this near home area. And this is an image done by a testing lab that, that tests. They've been doing a lot of wildland fire, uh, you know, resistance uh, testing to see what works and what doesn't. In this image, you know, they're, they're showing us how once you get stuff in that five foot area going, how quickly it, it can get the, the house on fire. So, you know, it's just trying to use a graphic example there. So let me talk about this image here. This is an image from the campfire by Stephen Quarles. He's a fire scientist, been around a long time, been studying this thing. He, he knows more about this than I think anybody. But what happened here is this, house had plants around it. 
And I don't know the whole story behind this house, but I've done fire investigations and looking at this, it looks to me like embers landed in these bushes and started the bushes going. Here, see how dry the grass is compared to like right here and out here, it's greener. I think what happened here is embers landed in these bushes and got these things going. This bush was totally consumed. You can see some smoke damage up under the E where the, the smoke from this kind of collected up there. Not enough to catch it on fire. Um, and then it got this bush going. Um, and I think probably what happened here is somebody came along and extinguished this bush before it was totally consumed, end up looking like this, this bush. Thank goodness they did because one of two things probably would have happened. It would have caught the eave on fire or it would have broke this window and got into the house because this window has a crack in the window. So a question came up earlier, how many homes do you think that survived were saved by firefighters? I think this is one of those, honestly. And see how green it is here? I think it's green there because the heat was mostly going up in this case. So it, the radiant heat here wasn't hot enough to dry it out as far out as it did here. So if you imagine the radiant heat coming off the body of this fire going out, most of the radiant heat's gonna come from up here because heat goes up. And I think that green area there is more or less a kind of a shaded area that was protected from the radiant heat. So that's my two cents there. But to me, that's another graphic example of um, why, you know, this zero to five foot is so important. And we'll talk about where and how to plant around that five foot area in just a moment. Hey, Roberta, just a time check. It's 2.48 right now. Okay, so thank you. And I'm gonna hand this off to Ellie. Um, and that kind of concludes my you know, my lecture on the zero to five foot with regard to the, the, the built environment, things other than plants. As I mentioned earlier, I know almost nothing about plants. So at this point, I'm gonna hand this off to Ellie and she's gonna talk about how best to plant, you know, in and around that five foot area. So, you know, essentially less combustible vegetation could be planted there um, and using the right plants is okay. Uh, who wants to have just something that looks like an, a jail around the outside of their house, right? So Ellie, I'm gonna go put myself on mute and hand this over to you. All right, thanks for reminding me about mute. Um, could you go back two slides and um because you have a couple of good slides there that, that can be a good right well one more a really good introduction one more there you go okay so um as we talked about earlier i'm with the sonoma ecology center and one of the elements that we bring to this discussion is the idea of sustainability and also biodiversity so you know i think a lot of people might jump to the conclusion that they should just cut everything down to keep their houses safe in the 100 foot zone. And what we like to say is it's entirely possible to have a landscape, a defensible space zone that is biodiverse and sustainable and beautiful. So I wanted Roberta to go back to the slide because um, a lawn is not sustainable. It, it, it brings it, it requires a lot of water and it's kind of a desert for wildlife and you can also see how in this case a lawn wouldn't have protected that property if the firefighters hadn't come so the best solution really is to do what Roberta said and work on the zero to five foot zone and there are other lawn alternatives which I'll talk about in a minute that aren't the thirsty kinds of lawns that we're used to so next slide Um, and this one is is really sweet because it's the, uh, another thing about the ecology center and the resilient landscapes coalition that we that we developed with UC Master Gardeners and the Habitat Corridor Project is we like to promote native plants because they are they they're where the butterflies and the birds and other wildlife 
developed ecologically. So native species of all kinds of animals really need the native plants. This picture, um, there are a few native plants in there, but most of it is um, exotic. But it is possible to have plants, and the point of this slide is it's possible to have plants fairly close. It's hard to tell exactly from this picture how close they are. I would say that some of those um, ferns are maybe three or four feet away from the house. Is that true, Roberta? This is your slide. Oh, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I'll just, you. I'll just okay. make it up. So yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know that much about this slide, but it looks like there's a rock here. So I would say they're at least 18 inches away from the sidewalk for the most part. It's hard to tell with perspective as you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. So anyway, here's an example of a pretty lush landscape that you could have that still actually honors the, the, near, the, the inside home ignition zone. The other thing about this particular photograph is everything is beautifully maintained. So if you are gonna have plants close to your house, you wanna make sure that you're out there with your pruners and or you're getting rid of all of the little pieces of dried material. The, um, the, the long stemmed plants with the tufty tops, that's a papyrus, which is, it's actually in the, it's a type of sedge. And the bottom part, which is brown, actually often has a lot of really dry dead material. So you, you really have to go in there and clean that out because you could get a fire there. And all of the other plants I know as the landscape architect, they don't usually look like that in most people's houses. So there's not a single speck of anything dead or dry there. And that's what it really needs to look like. An another example that, that um, Roberta is highlighting right now, the palm tree. And a lot of palm trees actually have dried um, fronds that at the base, and so that has to be trimmed up. So it's, you know, sometimes these pictures can be a little bit misleading um, as to how much work goes into keeping it clean. So next slide. And um, yeah, this is an example of, of planting in islands. So the five foot zone is clearly empty and obviously not an ignition hazard. As you get farther out, you have plants that are planted not too close to each other, but you can actually have some islands of plants because wildlife actually needs a habitat. They need some species of uh, birds and lizards and so on need cover from predators. So it's, it's a good idea to have little clumps and not sometimes not so little clumps as you get further out into the 30 and 100 foot zone, as long as you keep that five foot zone fairly clean. Next slide. So here's an example, and, I, and I'm crediting the people from the UC Master Gardener program in Marin, and also the Sonoma UC Master Gardener program. They've spent a lot of time um, investigating this, um, this question of what to do in the zero to five and further. In Marin, it actually, I think it's in Mill Valley, the city has a requirement that the first three feet from the house has no plants or virtually no plants in it. So this is from one of the Marin Master Gardeners who's also a Native Plant Society aficionado. And here's his house on the left before and then after. So he has some, you, there's some really nice non-combustible mulch like these pebbles that he chose because they're actually quite attractive and they, they're fairly close match to his house. So I think he went in later and put some potted plants along there but um, he took out, he had on the left, you can see uh, it's, it's very densely vegetated with rose and a, a very fibrous other species. I, the, put your pointer over on closer to the house because what he did on the left, he, he left most of that stuff, but on the right is what he cleaned out. Yeah, so next slide. And here's another example of the same thing where he cleaned out completely. But next slide. This, um, and I'm crediting April Owens, she's one of the Resilient Landscapes Coalition members. Uh, her organization is called the Habitat Corridor Project and she promotes native plants. So the, the picture on the left is something you can do if you don't wanna have it completely naked of plants. You can have 
and you can see different sizes and colors of pebbles can make it interesting. And this is a native rush or juncus that goes in and it's a kind of a modern look, which is, you know, it's nice, it's nice and clean. And it's really unlikely that that will catch fire. The picture on the right is some, as you can see, it's right next to the house and some nice pavers and planted in among them is a species of, it's like a daisy actually called Daimondia. It's not native, but it's a lawn substitute. And this photograph actually was approved by Caroline Safford, which, uh, who is the, the county person who is really promoting this non-ignition zone, as long as it's well hydrated. And this particular plant is very drought tolerant. Um, it's not a terrific uh, lawn substitute in the sense that it can't take the kind of traffic that most lawns can take. And that's why it works really well if you put pavers in so that you're not stepping on it all over the place. And then in the background is um, Festuca rubra. It's a red fescue, which um, if kept well hydrated and mown, it and as long as you keep it a little bit more than the, about five feet away from the house, it actually can work pretty well. So next slide. Ready for the next one. So this is when it starts getting kind of pretty and interesting. Again, we're going back to Marin where they have the three foot um, non-ignition zone that's mandatory. The plants that you see here are, almost all of them are native, and the pretty pink ones are coral bells. They're two different species of that, that plant, and those are very easy to find in local nurseries. And then there's some other little salvia plants. These are all what's called herbaceous perennials. You can trim them back and um, they grow just as beautiful next year or you know almost right away depending on when you trim them and then there's also some herbs in there i think there's a marjoram in the front or an oregano i can't really tell this because it's not my slide but um so you can actually have a lot of beauty and color and also this particular bed of plants is uh, attracts butterflies a tremendous number of butterflies and bees so it's also biodiverse and wildlife friendly so next slide This is taken from a different angle. This is actually the same bed. Um, this is actually what the coral bells and the salvia look like when you trim them back. So you don't have a moonscape. Um, it's, I think this would look a lot better if you brought some of the, um, the pebble mulch into it so that it wouldn't look like just a kind of a dirt landscape with a few plants coming out where it's barren there. Um, but yeah, so you can have vegetation as long as it's well hydrated and not right up against the plant, the house, because plants that are this small are really not going to create a, a huge bonfire that's going to catch the house on fire because it's far enough away. So next slide. And this is just another um, example of the same coral bells. These are actually planted closer to the house and I can, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I think, and, and well, actually let's move on to the next slide because Roberta and I've had a conversation about this and I, I think we'll, uh, oh, okay. So I'll get back to that. But I wanted to put in pictures of some really beautiful plants that you can plant in patches within the home ignition zone. Um, the upper left one is uh, called California fuchsia. These are native species. It's, um, its Latin name is epilobium. And it's beautiful. It's a hummingbird plant and it's, it's just terrific and you would want to prune it down during fire season, but it grows back really nicely. The one to the upper right is a, um, a buckwheat. It's a low growing buckwheat. That particular plant, it's also known as Ariaganum, is the Latin name. That particular plant I would put outside of the home ignition zone because it can actually be a little bit woody. The lower left is a catmint, um, which is, um, I'm forgetting the Latin name right now, but it's a native species and the bees love it. Um, Typically blue and purple plants are bee attractors. 
and the one on the lower right is a verbena. It's um, it's a vine. It's not a verbena. So uh, Roberta actually has all of the um, the notes. So Roberta, could you tell me? Can you do you see the speaker notes? She said I could do this all by myself without speaker notes, but she was wrong. Oh, now you've lost my picture. Um, it's a clematis. Okay, so all I needed was a little bit of time. It's a clematis, it's a vine. So we don't recommend growing those on any, um, any kind of trellis or other structure that's anywhere near the house, but it's actually a wonderful plant that um, is great for, for moths actually because it's white. Okay, next slide. And then a few more of these um, species that you could actually put in the zero to five zone. The upper left is a Dudleya, it's a succulent. There's dozens and dozens of these um, Dudleya species that you can grow, that you can buy in nurseries. And you could do some small patches and they get really quite spectacular flowers. Uh, the upper right is a blue-eyed grass, which is um, the native, the, the Latin name is Cicerinchium bellum, which I love being a kind of a plant nerd. I like names like that. Um, it's actually an iris and it has these beautiful purple flowers. Um, it's not a very big plant. They only grow to about a foot tall. Um, the lower left is another buckwheat. And then the lower right is a great plant. It's a native strawberry. And unfortunately the picture's a little fuzzy, but um, it's, a, it's a wonderful plant and you can actually eat the strawberries. Um, and it never grows more than like three or four inches tall. Next slide. So um, the one on the left, this is one that Roberta and I had a really interesting conversation about. And obviously this is a vegetation growing in the zero to five zone. There is a fair amount of discussion about how much is really okay. What it comes down to is it has to be a species of plant, and this isn't my slide, so I don't know exactly what that plant is, that you can prune down so there's no woody vegetation, because obviously the woody vegetation is going to be what will catch fire, and you need to keep it free of any sort of dead um, leaves or any other kind of dead material. And, um, and the, the discussion is the question of risk. It's if you, it, you wanna have beauty and, and you know, a, an aesthetically pleasing home, but you also wanna minimize your risk. So if the, wood, if the siding here wasn't wood siding, but it was fiberboard, like something like hardy board, you might be able to you know, push it a little bit more. If everything else around your house was a clear of five feet and this was your favorite plant, then maybe you've minimized your risk and it's, it's gone from 80% to 5% because those are the only plants you've left. So um, it really is, you know, as long as there's no co code ordinance that you have to have zero to five with no plants, you do need to make some personal decisions about what you want growing there. I think we're probably getting close to time up or past time up. So those are the main things I wanted to say. Roberta, do you wanna take back over? Um, okay, perfect. Thank you, Allie. Let me just blast through these. Yeah, we're just about ready to start taking questions. I, I want to run through a handful of others here. Um, this is similar to the one we saw earlier with the pavers in here. And the other thing too is if you do have plants that are potted, not a bad idea since they are modular, move them away before you evacuate. It just reduce your risk. Um, you know, this looks pretty good here. Plants below windows that have a maturity height that's going to be, you know, decently below the window ledge or window sill is probably okay. Um, once again, it's even better in that case if you have non combustible siding so that your siding doesn't get ignited once the plant gets ignited. Um, so, a question is in the queue about mulch. Um, you know, what's non combustible mulch? So I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about that real quick. This, the rocks are a form of non-combustible mulch. Um, gravels, non-combustible mulch. Bark is considered combustible mulch. Bark is kind of a generic term used for wood chips. I believe that if you actually took redwood bark 
ground it up it's in used at it's going to be less combustible than just wood chips proper but um you know when you say oh i'm going to put wood chips out here if you order wood chips i don't know of any place that where you can specifically specify redwood chips so when you're getting wood chips you know even if they're redwood i, I still unless it's actually redwood bark but even then I would be reluctant to use any kind of bark in that five foot area. You're just asking for problems. The other thing too to be aware of, I'll, I'll mention here, is after you come back from being evacuated and you're walking around your house, look or do that and look for where embers may have landed. Um, I think many of us have recently returned from being evacuated in Sonoma County from one fire or another. And when you get home, you notice amongst all the ash that's landed, there's little spots where, oh my gosh, look, there was an ember here, it just didn't take hold. So if you've got something like this and you get an ember that lands in there, keep checking it for days after the fire event because you can have something in there starting to smolder and get going and not even know it. And once it starts to take hold and gets a little more wind on it, it can, it can start building and eventually turn into a burning flame and start to burn you know things around it so just be aware of that um, uh, same here you know this is you know wood chips i believe it looks like out but they're five feet away um, i would say don't put anything like this any closer than five feet you know even then if you want to do a little strip here with plants and not put any bark there the farther the bark away is the better i like bark but um you know not real close to the house or even the fence you know bark next to a fence is just asking for an ignition um you know here's an example of, of something somebody did this is not too far out but i'm just going to go past it because it's really not relevant to the zero to five um here again you know some pretty stuff here low plants in front of the windows some nice hardscape here uh, and even then all this is really well maintained well irrigated so it does not have to be a moonscape you guys you know and then once again together if we all do our little bit on our own properties to reduce the chances of getting a fire going on our property then we have as a collective reduce the overall risk to our entire neighborhood in our community so so i'm gonna um stop screen share at this point uh, let me make sure i don't have anything else downstream here yeah oh reminder glad i looked uh, so our next two presentations are going to be thursday october 29th uh, from 2 to 3 30 and that next one is on the defensible space area the from the five foot area out to 30 feet or more 100 feet and then the one after that on november 5 from 2 to 3 30 is going to be on structural hardening so with that i am going to open this up for questions and the way i like to do this is kaylin are you still with us um she oh yeah she's still with us looks like maybe she took a break um so let's we'll get into the q a at this point and i like it when kaylin tosses us the questions but in, until she comes back online i'm gonna i'm gonna manage the questions and we have you know we have a good you know a good 20 minutes to get through them so rebecca writes we're thinking about eucalyptus tree chips for mulching about four to six inches i think thick is what you're talking about there rebecca is this fire fuel hazard i believe it would be i mean it's chip material chip combustible material and you know if it's out in that um you know in that zero to the five foot area in particular it's going to be quite quite a fire risk what do you think about that ellie with the combustible mulch as eucalyptus as combustible mulch yeah the the let's see it's i guess the university of nevada has done some studies about mulches and what they've discovered is that the the chips actually you know if you think about the 
the, a flame length, right? If, if anything's burning, the flame will be a certain height. And what they find is that chipped material actually can have a flame height. Maybe it's not that big, but it will actually be, it will catch fire. There are other, something called arbor mulch, which is a composted chipped material. And that is, uh, it's inexpensive and it doesn't ever get a flame length. It will actually smolder kind of like a cigar. Um, and you don't want that up against your house. You know, you want these, these non-flammable mulches like stone. But, um, but, if you, but in your yard further out, it's actually recommended to use this composted mulch, which is this arbor mulch. Um, you don't want it more than two inches thick now, is even though in the old days we were saying, you know, most landscape architects and gardeners, they would say a three inch minimum. Now it's in your defensible space, two inches is a, is a better solution. It's a, you know, it's a better standard. Okay. And then somebody writes, what do you say to homeowners who can't get insurance if they don't clear the 100 foot space? Um, if you, are in a wooey and if that's all it's going to take you to get insurance i would suggest you do the 100 foot space there are a lot of folks my insurance guy included he lives in napa he cannot get in fire insurance on his property on his home because he lives in an area where they won't insure it but if you're if you're one of those folks and all you need to do is show the insurance company that you've created you've got a good 100 foot space in my opinion, I would say do it. Um, Kaylin, it looks like you're back. It uh, looks like you may have had a technical difficulty. So would you mind tossing the questions to Ellie and I? I, I that way I can just focus on answering them. And I know, I have the worst luck of getting disconnected. Unfortunately, Zoom, one of their features is every time I'm disconnected, the, my, the questions go away. Oh, okay, that's so okay. I can't see what they are, so I've sorry. I know that they're, yeah, I'll, I know that I'll, Vanessa had a question in the, in the chat, um, but sorry about that. I you think remember? we're doing okay. I, I, I mean, we can see, I yeah. can see, you know, I think Roberta can. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I can feel them. Yeah. I wanted to say something about insurance. Um, and, and, you know, it's one of the things that we at the Ecology Center kind of grimace when we hear the word clear the hundred foot zone because you know I mean and people can misinterpret the word clear they, they might think that means take everything down and create a moonscape but it's not I mean and that's what our workshops are about for the resilient landscapes coalition and and I think Roberta will be talking about it in the next workshop but you don't have to take everything out you can have it still be beautiful and I know that if you can get a you know get your local fire whatever professionals out and they can fill out a form that could convince that, that theoretically your insurance company will accept um, saying that you have adequately um, created defensible space. Yeah, it, right? it, it depends on the insurance company. I'm working with a group, a nonprofit called Policyholders United, and we're working on trying to resolve some of those insurance conundrums that folks are experiencing. And there's there's almost, well, there's very little, I've come to discover that there doesn't seem to be a lot of consistency in, between insurance companies in terms of what they're using to measure their risk and, and how they're covering properties and one property from the other. Some of them, if you're in the particular zip code, they won't cover you, period. Some, I believe will come out and actually look at your property and you know base your premium on the actual risk as they see it things like that but it's it's all over the map right now like I said my insurance guy he can't get insurance where he lives um, I, I have heard that if you form a firewise community um, you know using the NFPA standard then some insurance companies will give you a percentage reduction on your premium. Um, but you know, that, that's a big nut to crack and it's gonna take a couple of years to, to get any um, momentum on that. Or we've got momentum, but to get any traction on that's gonna take a while. In my perfect world, the insurance companies would all be using the same objective 
a set of standards to apply to all of the properties that they're covering such that um, it's fair across the board and you know you're, you're comparing apples to apples instead of just one insurance company looking on a map oh you have a fire hydrant within 500 feet oh you're in a zip code we cover you're okay or you're not in a zip code we cover kind of a thing that doesn't make and sense. i think ideally the the you know in at least hopefully sooner rather than later they'll be recognizing that getting this five foot non-ignition zone down and home hardening because that's really what we're finding and a lot of research is showing is causing more home fires than the surrounding landscape although that is really important too yeah and then i may have this has been asked and answered, Mark writes, what is a non-combustible mulch? What about material from a chipper? If it's, if it's wood, it's combustible, and I wouldn't put it in the zero to five, um, actually. Um, Lynn, hey Lynn, glad to see you. So what's your opinion of Dutch white clover or other low-growing clovers? Ellie, you're gonna have to take this one. I have no idea. Yeah, I, um... I wish I knew like where you're talking and how much you were recommending. I, I personally am not an expert on clovers. I, I do know that they're they're more drought tolerant and you know I I think that you could use them in the zero to five. You could because you could just mow it down to practically nothing. And it and it's not native, so you know, obviously that doesn't pass my test, but it's it seems like it would be totally fine in, you know, in areas around your house. Okay, Cindy Jones writes, I have masonite siding comment. Uh, well, Cindy, it depends on the substrate and stuff. There's actually, in older houses, they actually have asbestos siding in some of the older houses that look like shingles. And so, you know, masonite, if for those that don't know, it's like a hardboard. It's a very, very compressed material. It's a composite material um, that I believe is very hard to ignite. It is a, a composite, but it is a combustible material. It, it's not, in my opinion, as combustible as a wood material, a solid wood material like wood siding. Um, but once again, if it's masonite, it's probably on top of a, a plywood substrate. So if you've got any gaps in any of that, if they're masonite sidewall shingles, then you wanna make sure that whatever gaps you have are, are sealed up at as tight as you can get. The, the thing you're looking for is remember, you know, embers the size of rice. Imagine where they can land in any of those nooks and crannies around the outside of your house or on your house. Uh, if, if an ember can land there, then it can, start a fire there. So um, yeah, that's that's the thing there, Cindy. Um, Cindy also writes, I have a lot of wood decking and rail in an extended wood deck headed into a wooded area. Can I apply a fire retardant to the wooden deck? Yeah, you can apply a fire retardant to almost anything. California doesn't have that I'm aware of any um, certified fire retardant materials that's meant for the exterior of your house. There are some intermittent paints out there that are um, on the market that are I think pretty good but I don't know of any that have been certified by the California State Fire Marshal yet in the problem when I was the fire marshal for the, the county the I looked into this and at the time the problem with getting those certified is they have to be properly applied. So they have to have a certain, they have to be applied to a certain thickness, a certain mill, they measure them in mills. And to get from here to there, you have to have a program where you can certify inspectors that are certified to go out and measure those thicknesses and take random samples as part of that approval once the paint has been applied. Um, personally, if I could afford it, I would probably paint my house with that kind of paint. And then in terms of fire retardants in general, 
you can get them, you can purchase them online or off the shelf. They're, you know, I'm picturing materials like you would apply to a Christmas tree. They can be applied to fabrics and things like that. They do have a shelf life. They're not the ones that I'm speaking of and I'm, I'm aware of. They're not meant to be applied to exterior surfaces of a house. Um, I imagine they'll offer, offer some protection, but you know, in my opinion, if you've got the deck into the wooded area, at least give yourself that five foot distance between the deck and the combustible vegetation or farther, you know, is even better. Um, let's see, done, did that one. Um, we have a wood shed, uh, Mandy writes, we have a wood shed where we keep firewood uh, too near our house, I realize. Would it help to cover the wood shed with plywood or should the whole thing be moved because it is wood? It's probably within the five foot. If, if it's within the five foot, I would treat it the same way you would treat your house. You know, close it up for members, make sure that wherever an ember lands in or near it, it's not going to get the shed going because that's part of your house. It's the same as lighting your house on fire. If it were me, I think I would probably lean more towards moving the house, the, the shed away from the house. Um, but I just imagine where those embers will land. Okay. And then looks like the last question. Um, let me uh, do that and run. Um, let's see. Masonite siding I talked about. Um, Cindy says her, her, her siding's not asbestos. Yeah, I know there's some asbestos out there. Masonite's different. And then Sharon writes, what would you think about using square pavers with one inch separation and planting a low growing creeping herb like thyme instead of a solid hardscape like concrete up against the house? I'm, the way I'm picturing that, uh, Sharon, is, is I think that's doable. Ellie, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was doing the thumbs up over here. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, no, it seems like that would be okay for, yeah. I mean, that there's, depending on like whether it's in the sun or the shade, obviously, whether time would grow well there or not is something to take, you know, take in consideration. Yeah. Okay, and Cindy, I just lowered your hand because I think you had your hand up to ask the question you asked in the queue. If that's not correct, just go ahead and put the question in the queue or raise your hand again. Um, okay, and then I'm just checking the chat real quick to see. Uh, looks like there's a lot of good information put in the chat. So just so you know, there's some websites and things like that that Ellie and Kaylin put in the chat that you might find useful. Um, if there are any questions somebody put in the chat that we have not answered, please let us know, put them in the Q&A, and then we will, um, yeah, we'll get to them. But aside from that, looks like we've settled all the Q&A and we have like six minutes left. Uh, oh, Carolyn, just in time. Carolyn writes, what do you recommend for privacy screens and fencing within the five foot zone? So um, that's a very good question. I'll tell you what, I tried to put in a, my house is corrugated, an architecturally appealing corrugated metal fencing material rather than a solid wood fencing material. So frame of, you know, larger dimension material like two by at least, you know, four by fours and two by four by four posts and two by four rails and then corrugated metal in there, but our homeowners association didn't let me do that. So I ended up with open wire mesh for my fence, which is not a really good screen. Um, Ellie, any ideas on maybe some plants you can plant, maybe a climbing material you can put on a non-combustible, like a wire fence to create some screening? Um, that, well, that's an you, idea. You could, um... I mean, anything you grew, like the clematis that I showed, within five feet of the, I mean, you'd have to keep it like super, super well pruned. And I mean, that's not impossible. It, um, and it is, it's, it's a challenge though, if it's gonna be enough of a screen that 
you know, you, you're not seeing your neighbors, then it's hard to keep it well pruned um, or clean, you know, cleared of any um, debris. But what I wanted to mention is um, that there's another question about any more plant ideas. The Resilient Landscape Coalition um, has a lot of um, plant ideas. And there's also, Kaylin put in the webs in the um, chat box, the RCD, the uh, Santa Monica RCD has some, uh, some very good recommendations too. And um, so I'm gonna put the Resilient Landscapes Coalition.com is our website, or, or just type in, you know, Resilient Landscapes. And I actually have to check and make sure that that actually is our website. <laughs> I haven't looked at it in a while. It's not an easy one to remember. But we, but we do have a, a number of good plant recommendations. Yeah, and then somebody in the chat, it looks like they asked what company we are. Well, um, I am the president and CEO of Fire Safe Sonoma. We are Sonoma County's countywide Fire Safe Council. And our mission is to provide education and outreach with regard to wildland fire safety and education countywide. We also help with uh, wildfire planning will help folks craft community wildfire protection plans, things like that. We can help local community groups with getting grant funds to do projects. Um, you just really need to have a cohesive working group to do a lot of the legwork and the heavy lifting. We can't do all of it, but if you've got champions within your community that are willing to do that, there's a lot of things you can do. You can also start a local fire safe council and we can help with that. And then Kaylin is a Civic Spark fellow. She is part of Fire Safe Sonoma and she also is sharing her time with the Goldridge Resource Conservation District. And Ellie, um, you wanna just kind of close out and follow up with what, what you all do as well, because it looks like they do. Um, yeah, there's, so, you know, one thing I've learned, and I've been just involved in this for about 18 months, is that there are so many organizations, and, and you know, our group is, is an example of that. So there's the Sonoma Ecology Center, which does a lot of work around um, fire management, um, and, and I am helping them with the defensible space part, but there's so the, the, if you look up the Sonoma Ecology Center, they have some we have some really good resources. And then there's the Habitat Corridor Project, and they have their own website. And then there's the the Master Gardeners of Sonoma County. So that's what my group is: is those three organizations: the Sonoma Ecology Center, the Habitat Corridor Project, and Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County. Um, and I put in the the website for the our three organizations together is called sonoma Resi resilient landscapes.com sonoma resilient landscapes.com all one word um and yeah so so we, we tr we're trying to bring a, a lot of information together in one place and that's that's what we're trying to do i did want to there are a couple of more questions um we have rosemary close to the house is that a no-no I have rose. I had rosemary close to my house, and I it is a no-no. It actually becomes very woody, very dense. It's like it's kind of like a miniature juniper, um, and I really don't recommend it. I cut it back 15 feet. It, it it came in at a 90 degree angle to my house, and the bees love it. So it's it's really hard for me to take it out completely. But you can keep it in a patch in an island surrounded by, you know, something that's less flammable, like you know, some sort of a, a native lawn like uh, red fescue or even papers um, so if you don't want to get rid of it. There's an, another question about decks. Um, yeah, I was going to answer that next, yeah. Can, can I say, can I say something? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> you want to take it? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Well, um, I just finished a deck and, you know, it's, there's a, um, a class A rated wood called um, I think Ipe is it's a it's a hardwood and it's it's also from um, where from like the Philippines so anyway it may not be sustainable for the transportation but another one is called Batu B A T U and they are class A rated just like your roof um, as opposed to redwood or cedar which are not and they're and they're very flammable and um, 
Roberta told me that there's another thing if you put a deck in and you, even if you do have class A wood for the surface of it, the, the joists underneath of an, an ember could get in there. And so you want the joist to be covered with a aluminum or some kind of metallic uh, tape so that if an ember falls into it, even though the deck's not, the decking's not bad, the joist is protected too. Yeah, yeah, and we, we go into that in more detail in the structural hardening presentation. But the, the big thing about decks, you know, in terms of trying to do something with it, I think it's the question when you're ready to evacuate. There, you know, the best thing you could do, I think, is just maintain that five foot or more around the deck. Treat the deck as part of your house. Get any combustibles off of it, even though the deck itself may be combustible. Um, and then the other big thing with decks that increase the hazard is the gaps between the boards can collect, you know, finer materials than the two by material itself, the decking material itself. So you want to make sure, you know, after you blow off all the leaves or whatever's on there with your leaf blower, or sweep it off, you may want to get in there with a screwdriver or, or a knife or something and make sure those gaps are clear of, of any kind of combustible pieces of leaves or pine needles or just stuff that, that collects in there like little dust bunnies or whatever. Um, just get that stuff out of there because the ember lands in there. Once again, it's kind of like when you're the Girl Scouts, when you learn how to make a fire, you know, you want that fine little material to start the fire going. Well, that's the stuff that collects between your deck boards. So, you know, that's my biggest suggestion is make sure you don't have that stuff between your boards. Um, well, that's about it. We are at 332. Um, somebody else asked about our home assessments. It looked like in the chat. Uh, if if you need a home assessment, Fire Safe Sonoma, we don't have funding to do them outside of the project area where this um, presentation is focused. If you live out in West County, Occidental, Monterey, Rio Nido, Timber Cove, Fort Ross, uh, out that way, Gurnville, Armstrong, Woods Road, whatever. If you live out that way, Go ahead and shoot us an email at um, firesafesonoma staff at gmail.com or firesafe.sonoma.org at gmail.com. You can get us on the website too. But shoot us an email or give us a phone call and we can schedule you for a home assessment. If you're out of that project area, we just finished two grant funded projects to do a bunch of those outside. So we're we're seeking funding to do more of those. I don't know that we'll be able to do more this season. We are working on it, but um, check, keep checking back with us on Facebook and the website. And you know, once we get more funding to do more of those, we'll, we'll put it back up there for you guys. Um, so let's see, well, that's all I have. So thank you guys all for attending. It looks like some of you are leaving now. We're down from 50 to 24, but uh, thanks to those who have left already for attending and all of you that stuck around thank you extra thanks for all you guys for for hanging around it looks like kayla and had to look like she got disconnected again but thank you kaylin for all your help and ellie i am so happy you helped me do this very last minute to pull you into it but having an expert like you cover the plants is way better than somebody like myself who's got a black thumb so thank you very fun. much for helping thanks, us for, thanks for letting me share Absolutely. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you for our next presentation. And pass the word around, you know, if, if this webinar was of value to you, go ahead and tell folks to check out the Sonoma Ecology Center and check out Fire Safe Sonoma. And, you know, we're here to help you guys out. So with that, I'm gonna say toodaloo.